Um, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43. And as you're turning there, I will remind you of our meeting and uh, be praying for Brother Tate. Um, that the Lord be giving exactly what we need, not necessarily what we want, but what we need, and then all will be well. Isaiah 43, and we're going to begin in the very first verse. Isaiah 43, in the very first verse, the Bible says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he formed thee, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, that thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I, I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia, Ethiopia and Sabah for thee. Since thou was precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, I have loved thee, therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even everyone that is called by, thy, by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Bring forth the blind people, with eyes and the deaf that have ears, let all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled who are among the who are among them can declare this and shew us the former things. Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say it is truth. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the ones that have came this morning. We pray for the sick that meet among us, Lord, that you would heal them. Lord, we pray in the day which we live that we might be a testimony of thy word. Lord, that you might bless it. Lord, we praise Brother Tate comes our way this week, Lord, that you would fill his soul with the Holy Spirit, Lord, that he might know exactly what we stand in need of and when he preaches behind this pulpit lord that you would give him uh, strength from on high lord that you would uh that you would guide him and lead him and bless him with your spirit we pray now that you would bless this word to the hearts of the hearers and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all for it is in christ's name we do pray amen now, I'll be preaching this morning simply on the God of the Bible. Now, remember, uh, there's a God of this world and the God of the Bible. Now, most of the time when we think of uh, God of this world, we think of Satan. But what does the Bible say concerning Lucifer or Satan? What was he? He wasn't a God. He was an angel right? He was a fallen angel. So the God of this world is not Satan. The God of this world is the, God, is the way that God Jehovah is viewed today. That he is just up there uh, wondering what you might do and wondering if maybe you'll accept him and wondering if uh, the next storm is going to take you out. That is not the God of the Bible, but it is the God that's worshipped today, the God that depends on you instead of you depending on him. That's the God of today. 
And that is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible does, needs no help. He does not need you. He does not need me. He is the God that all things are beneath his feet. That's the God of the Bible. Now, we see in our text in Isaiah's writing that he says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee. Now, pretty much uh, Isaiah had listed the destruction of Israel and how the destruction of Israel would occur and how they would be brought down. And then he begins this uh, this chapter, if you will. I know it's divided by translators, but this thought with but. In other words, despite that. In other words, I know that's a real thing, but listen to this part too, but. You ever think about if you get a, a bad diagnosis from the doctor and then he says, but, but there's treatment, but there's surgery we can do. Uh, there, all, uh, there are alternatives to this. Often that is good news. But now saith the Lord that created thee. Now this morning, if you want to view God as he's presented as the God of the Bible, you remember this, he created you. He spoke you into being before the world became, and so therefore you are under him. He, you, he's not under you, you are under him. He is the one that's lifted up. He's the one that uh, is far above you in every way. He is uh, the creator. And, you know, a lot of times we only think that he creates the good. What does it say concerning Pharaoh? For this reason, I have raised up Pharaoh. God created Pharaoh for the express purpose uh, to, uh, to, sh to so that God might shew his people his power. And we know that Pharaoh was taken down in that. He was destroyed. He was killed. And all his army, but I want you to see he was created for that express purpose. Now, the question is this morning, what were you created for? What, what was his purpose in you? But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and have formed thee, O Israel. Now think a moment about Jacob and, and what occurred in his life and uh, uh, the things that befell him along the way. And all that was part of God's plan. Every little thing that occurred was in the will of God. And I don't know what really has happened. I know all of you very well. But in reality, I don't know everything that's happened to you. And you know what I have found? The biggest things that happen to us are all up here. That's how Satan attacks, is it not? Remember when, remember when uh, Elijah was attacked by Jezebel? Did Jezebel ever raise a finger against him? No. All she said was, uh, uh, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be just like one of those prophets of Baal. Now, she had nothing to accomplish that with, but you know what? He believed it, he heard it, and he grew the thought up here until he ran from her like a scalded dog, right? And it was all just up here in his mind. In fact, he said, Elijah, when God arrived on the scene, he says, what doest thou here, Elijah? What are you even doing up here in the middle of nowhere? And what he was was just kind of uh, focusing on Satan, focusing on the enemy rather than, than the Lord. Oh, uh, who created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, and I believe this is national Israel. It could have been, uh, it could have been the per, uh, the one that became Israel. But I think it was the the nation Israel. He says, "I did that." You know what? Every nation upon this earth, God has created. Some for honor and some for dishonor. Isn't that what He said concerning His vessels? 
that some would glorify him and some would would uh, try to take him down. That 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 was the the natural thing. And I believe I read the other day. Uh, and you think about the world as being so large. But I think I read the other day. There's only like 210 nations on the face of the earth, which that may seem like a big number, but when you consider the massive. Uh, vastness of the planet we live on, that's really not that much. And, and we see that he created every one of those. I have redeemed thee. Now, if you're saved this morning, he's redeemed you because it's an impossibility to redeem yourself. If you're a slave, you're a slave till somebody buys you, right? There's nothing you can do about it. You can't, you can't by yourself, that would be an impossibility because you know what? A slave can't own anything. Right. You ever think about that? When slavery was real in the United States, they could possess no money. They didn't possess the land that they worked. They worked the land, but it wasn't theirs. And, and so redeemed means that, you, that someone else buys you. Someone else creates you. Someone else makes you. That, that is the, the God of the Bible. So as Isaiah is writing them, he reminds them, hey, y'all had nothing to do with this. I have called thee by name. Thou art mine. Isn't it a wonderful thing when he called you by name? When the gospel became something besides generic and became something rare, real, I called thee by name. So we first of all see that the real God of the Bible is a Bible that is a God that owns you, that has bought you, that has redeemed you, and you're his. Isn't that a wonderful thing? A lot of people would think that was entrapment in the modern day, but I rejoice in it because you know what? That means that I will always have a provider. Now, I'm, when I say provider, I don't mean that you're not going to go hungry. That's modern day God. What, what the God of the Bible says, he'll always be with me. He'll always be with me. You know what? There were saints of old that starved to death. Literally starved to death. But you know what? Right up to that last breath, God was with them. And, and so we see that is the God of the Bible. And you know what? I believe he's a provider. I've never went without. But there may be a day that I come to that I do do without. And if I do, he's with me. Now some precious promises. When thou passest through the water, I will be with thee. Now, when we think of being going through the water, what is the two events that we think of? We think of the Jordan River crossing. We think about the crossing of the Red Sea. You know what? Both of those had already occurred before this was written. So that says to me, you know what? There's more water coming, but I'll get you through it. <clears throat> You ever, uh, now, I've told y'all before, I don't even really rem remember learning to swim uh, because we just learned very young at home. But I do remember one event, it probably had to be in the early 70s because my great-grandmother was still living. And James, being the wonderful big brother he was, had me out, y'all remember those little rafts you could blow up and had like a little pillow on one end and blew up. He had me out in the creek on one of the, them and was moving me, and all of a sudden it flipped over. Now, how that occurred, I'm not sure, but it flipped over, right? And I was down in the water, and I'd never seen my mother move so quick, and she was up off the creek bank. She dove into the water, and she had me back up. And you know what? She sustained me. She, she kept me up. See, that's what our God does for us. He, he takes us through the water, but there is water to see. You see what I'm saying? And, and so you're not going to be exempt from the water, but he is going to take you through the water. Remember, the water is going to be present, 
but he's greater than the water. When thou passest through the water, I will be with thee. And through the uh, uh, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire. Now, I, I don't know much about Bible history as well as Adam is versed, but I do know this that Daniel and Isaiah were almost contemporaries. When we think about the Bible, because how the King James is arranged, we think about them being in sequence of time. They're not. They're arranged by the length of the book is really how they're arranged. And so Isaiah is longer than Daniel, so Isaiah come first. But understand, if they weren't contemporaries, they didn't miss it by much. So you know what had already probably happened? I was just on the cusp of happening. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So if that had already occurred, you know what? More fire's coming. Who's going to get you through it? Who, who's going to make, uh, who, who's going to be there for you? Well, the very same one that was walking in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he's going to be with us walking in the flame. And you know what? I bet they were never the same again after they walked through the flames with the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, remember the king, he looked down in that hole and he says, I see a fourth man like unto the Son of God. You know what the Son of God? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that says? The uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Russellites are wrong. He existed long, long before the days of Bethlehem. He was walking in, he was walking in the flames. You know what? That kind of excites me a little bit. It almost makes me, hey, if Jesus is going to be there with me, maybe I need a little flame. I think that would help a lot of the Lord's people today. Amen. Because flame is a purifier. It gets off the dross, which I think we're about to eat up with in the modern day. Verse 3. How or why is he going to be able to do all this? For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel. Now we read, uh, we, we read very quickly, and I'm not sure how many times the word holy occurs in our King James Bible, but I would say at, at least over 2,000. Now when you read a word 2,000 times, it becomes pretty routine, does it not? But when he introduces himself and says, I'm the Holy One. You, you know what holy means? It means sinless. It means no fault. It means there's no problems there. Not one little idle time. That's the God of the Bible. Fully sinful. Full, I mean, so, fully sinless. Fully powerful. That's the God of the Bible. He, you know what? It's sometimes, you know, and, and you're talking about Isaiah and the nation of Israel. You know what? They ought to know that. So what, what was the purpose of all this? He was reminding them. You know what? We, we forget the character of God sometimes, and we need some good reminding. Mm -hmm. We need to be reminded how great and wonderful of God he really is. And so we find we find that as well. I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Now, nine-tenths out of the time, who is the Savior speaking of? Christ, right? So in this element in this wonderful Godhead, the triune God of the Bible, we say, I, I'm, you know what? Christ was speaking there too. Now, that says two things. Number one, Christ is eternal. And to know one is to know the other. How many people know Donna, the midwife? How many people know Donna, the mother-in-law? <laughs> How many people know Donna, the daughter? We all do, right? She's, she, she's all those things in one. 
That's, that's just how God is. So we see way back, many, many, many years before the arrival of Jesus Christ, he refers to himself as Savior. Now, I don't know what you're going through this morning, but I do know this, Christ is your Savior. He is the answer. He is uh, the, the, full, the full answer of the problem. I gave Egypt for thy ransom. Now, you think about the entire nation of Egypt. At that time, the most wealthy nation ever. Sometimes they find so much gold in, in, in the remains of Egypt that it exceeds almost their understanding. That wealth was taken to nothing by who? Was it the children of Israel? Absolutely not. It was null and void because of God. You know, that's both very much honoring, and it makes me fearful too. He can make you know and void too. See, that, that is the God of the Bible. That's why he demands respect and, and demands worship because it's all every bit under his feet. He destroyed Ethiopia and Saba for the very same reasons. Verse 4, since thou was precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable. What were you precious in, in God's sight and precious in Christ's sight? Precious in the Holy Spirit's sight? Because if they were all there at creation, and I certainly believe they were even prior to creation, you were precious to them then. And I think about how filthy and disgusting and, 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 and what a deplorable creature I am in, in comparison to God. And I'm like, why would he possibly do that? Well, I can answer you, and the Bible answers you the same thing in, in Ephesians 1 for his own glory. He, it wasn't to make you exempt from hell. It was to glorify himself. And we find the very same thing, <laughs> again, probably at least 1,500 years before the, before the arrival of Christ, and he is saying the very same thing then. I love thee, therefore I will give men for thee and people for thy life. So what does all that mean? He's going to send supporters along the way. You ever had somebody in your life, uh, a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ, that just made a lasting impression on the entirety of your life? Uh, that was Brother Downs for me. And listen, he wasn't exempt from problems. I understand all the difficulties he faced. But you know what? God used him. Elijah wasn't, wasn't cream of the crop when he believed uh, Jezebel over God. But man, he laid a lasting impression on Elisha, didn't he? And so we find he's going to put these individuals in our life to provide support, to provide, to provide education, to provide help in the time of need. Listen, uh, I don't know what's coming next, but I do know this. God will be there, and he will place someone in my life to steady things out. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Isn't that the God of the Bible? Isn't that the God that we serve? Certainly it is. Verse 5, <laughs> after all that, fear not. And I want you to see uh, if I understand English the way I, uh, I remember that, that's a complete sentence by, himself, by itself because that colon there means it's two sentences. They're better together, but fear not is all by itself one sentence. Now, who is it addressed to? Because my, my English teacher would have asked that, what's your subject, Larry? <laughs> we are. You fear not. The subject is understood. The subject is the one that it's being addressed to. You know what? Fear will paralyze you. Will it not? 
Donna got rid of the lemon. I hope her fears are a lot better in the days ahead. Right? She's learned to be a mechanic through this. She was afraid to hit the ignition sometime. Fear not. Are you fearful today? Are you fearful of what might be next? Remember who we're serving. Remember, remember who is the God of that book. Fear not. Don't let it paralyze you. You know what? When you're under full fear, I will guarantee you, and I know it presents in many, many different ways, but when you're in full fear, I will guarantee you, you are doing nothing for Christ. Fear not. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. Now, the next several verses, uh, no doubt, are applicable to Israel, and he did accomplish that. In fact, he's still accomplishing that. When the Gaza Strip becomes uh, becomes Israel again, Israel, belonging to Israel again, you know what? There'll be even more Jews go over there. But he gathers people together for us, right? The east and the west. Me and Don live north of here. Right? Sarah and Adam live east of here. He gathers us all together, right? The church ought to be a support one to the other. And, and, and certainly it should be. He, he give us this together. And he, he continues to do that. That is part of the strength. Verse 8. Bring forth the blind. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Now, these individuals have the parts, but they don't have the ability. Uh, you know what? Blind people that don't have eyes will never, ever see. But blind people that at least has the hardware, Christ will speak to them. You know what that kind of sounds like to me? That they were predestined to see because they were born with all the equipment. Same, way, same thing with people that have ears, but they're not yet hearing. They have, they have the ability, it's just not being turned on. Almost sounds like an elect person, don't it? A person that God has foreordained to salvation, it just hadn't happened yet. It's not clicked the switch. He said, these individuals will look at me. These individuals will listen to me. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Think about the day he finally flipped the switch to you, and you're never qu ever quite the same again. That's, that's the God of the Bible. That, that is the one to be honored. But in the modern day and in the, in the modern religion and the filth that's being taught today, you were never blind. You were never deaf. But we find that the Bible teaches things quite differently. You ever worked with a blind person? They're pretty much, if you get them out of their element, they're pretty much dependent on you. Now, long, as long as you stay in that little bitty cusp, blind people do very well in their own house. Did you know that? They can cook for themselves. They can clean their own house. But you get them out of their element, and they're in trouble. Uh, I, think, I think today, <laughs> uh, those, those things concern me. Blind people can't see. And I believe we live in a day and age almost where the blind, the sinners, the deaf, the sinners are being taught that they can do all these things under their own decision. You know what? I have no doubt that every blind person on the earth today, if they could decide to be seen, I believe they decided pretty quick, don't you? But that's an impossibility, is it not? It doesn't exist. And so we find the Lord Jesus here said, you bring those kind of people to me and I will do something for them. 
But all the nations, verse 9, be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and shew us the former things? Now, I want you to see in verse 9, he wanted them to see the former things. Brother Junior and Eric and I were talking about how revival really happens. You know what? That is almost a form, a former thing, thing that's historic, thing that doesn't exist anymore. You know what? That's what the devil wants you to believe. I believe that the Lord is able to still bring the revival in 2023, don't you? I don't know that we're ready for it, but if he is sovereign, if he is the God of the Bible, that's not changed. So revival is, in fact, under his ability, right? I believe he's the giver of it. I don't think we can work it up in the flesh. I don't think that we can uh, cause it to happen. But I know one that can. That is the God of the Bible. He says, you remember those things. Listen, if you have an inkling of what revival is about, you remember it this morning. Let them bring forth their witnesses, people that know what revival is about, people that have experienced Christ. Let them bring forth that they may just be justified and let them hear and say it is truth. Now, who is hearing this? Who is saying, yes, that's true? The death. Ye are my witnesses, verse 10, saith the Lord, and my chosen, whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me. He chose us to believe. He chose us. He says, I have chosen you that ye might believe. I have chosen you that you might understand I am he. Wherefore, before me there was no God formed. Now, I want you to say, prior, he says, prior to me, which there is no prior to God, right? It's impossibility. Huh. There was no God formed. Now, you think about all the gods that's been formed since then. As uh, Paul was walking across Mars Hill, and he found the, he found the, uh, idol to the unknown God and all the others that were up there. Think about Egypt. They, they were worshipers indeed. Now, they worshiped people. They worshiped the current Pharaoh. You know what? That There's been gods ever since. But the Lord God says here, I was before all of those and it also shows to me, remember we're talking about the great God of the Bible, those false gods were in his permissive will. He knew they would come. He knew they would be there. And you know what? He knew even further the vessels of wrath that would follow that mess. That's the God of the Bible. And you know what's even more glorious? He knew his elect that would escape that mess. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That's the God of the Bible. It's not the God that necessarily people like to hear about today, but it causes my own soul to rejoice that this is the God that I serve. Verse 10, You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. Does the joy of this make you want to be witnesses? I had an Amish fellow call me last night. He has a sick baby, and uh, he's never done this, but uh, he said, well, Larry, and I mean, it was a sick, sick baby. And my advice is you need to get that kid somewhere. Sound like to me, just from what he told me on the phone, that the kid had RSV very dangerous virus, especially to young children. And this little boy was like a year and nine months. 
he needed to get to a doctor. And he started about what Amish do. And I said, I don't know what the Amish do. But I'm, I'm telling you, ask for my opinion. And I'm telling you what I would do. And you know what? That's the only place I could leave it. I couldn't go get that kid and throw him in my truck and run off to the doctor with him. You know why? Because he's not mine. And see, the Lord God, he can do what he will. But all we, we can give them the gospel, we can take it there and leave it in the hands of Almighty God. That's all we can do. That, that, that is how to give him worship. That is how to lift him up, not try to get somebody saved, not to get them to say a little prayer, but leave it in the hands of God. I have chosen you, my servant. So if he's chose you, he's also chose you to servitude, to slavery, to follow him, to... to uh, to do everything that he wills you to do. Why? That you may know and believe me. Now remember, we're talking about walking through the fire and walking through the flood. Why would he do that to us? That you may know me. Now I know God, but I'm not, I, I know there's been times I know there's attributes of God, let me put it that way, that I've not yet experienced. And I will guarantee you there's some you haven't experienced either. Now we think of sickness, I've experienced some of that. We think of huh, money problems, I've experienced some of that. But you know what, there's been a lot of things I haven't experienced. You know what water has the capability to do? Drown you. Right? Take your life. You want to swim it or walk through it? That is the difference. Now, I used to could swim good. Now I get very tired very quickly. I swim across the Cumberland River. Wouldn't it be a joy to walk across it? <laughs> I haven't experienced that yet. Fire burns. Matthew was our play with fire kid. And he did it up till his clothes caught on fire. And then he learned the lesson that me and Donna had taught, tried to teach him for 10 years, you don't play with fire. You know what, I've not walked through the fire yet, have you? But I know if that happens, he'll be with me. He, he, he'll take me through the flood and the fire because that is exactly who he is. In fact, we ought to be glad when those times come. And understand that I, I, I want you, it says, so you can believe in me and understand me. You know, the older I get, at least I hope, I think it's right, the more I understand God. And I believe that's with every person that has ever been, and as long as anybody that ever lives. If you serve God, the longer you serve Him, the more you know about Him. And not just His provision, not just His salvation, just know the character of God. You know what? When I was young, I, I'm sure I thought at times there were some things out of God's ability or maybe even out of God's interest. I had a friend, and I believe he saved one time. His, his, uh, his uh, sister-in-law was looking at two houses, and one fell through altogether. And they were about to be able to buy a second house. And she told this man, I believe God was in this because she got the better house out of the two. But God had to end one to start the other. And this man said, I don't believe God's in things like that. Oh, I do. You know what? 
<laughs> Wherever you're living this morning, you're exactly where God placed you. And if you're not, I'll say this, you're a miserable person. Because see, when we're in his permissive will, that part of his will is a miserable place to be. It's a time of learning, but it's not a very pleasant time. And, and so we, we find that the Lord God puts us in these situations that we might learn and that we might know his character and who he is. Before me, uh, there, uh, excuse, before me, there was no God, neither shall there be after me. Uh, verse 11, and we'll wrap it up. I, even I am the Lord. Besides me, there is no Savior. Now, I was talking yesterday, Friday, to a Campbellite woman. And I asked her, I said, how do y'all negate the existence of the Holy Ghost? And she goes, well, we believe John 1-1. And I said, well, I believe John 1-1 John too. And I quoted it to her. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I said, it doesn't say anything about the Spirit, does it not? It says that the Word, and in fact, if anybody's mentioned there as the Word, it's Christ, right? You ever wonder why that? Why, why, why is that so difficult? Because no ears, no eyes. You know, I walked from that way a few years ago. I beat my head against the wall and thought, she doesn't have, she, she's foolish. You know, when I walked away from that on Friday, I was like, that's the God of the world. And I was okay with that. We need to understand who God is.